Hello everyone, welcome to episode 2 of season 2 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, two. you get me, so many 2's <laughs> um, But yeah, nevertheless, I'm Nathan Aday, um, animator, podcaster, Christian So many things, so many words you can use to describe me But um, I'm just passionate for empowering people, man Especially other guys like me, young black guys um, growing up from in from different backgrounds and I just want to create a safe space where we can all talk about our mental health um, but obviously as you can tell from the information on this episode I'm talking with a female and she's not British either she's American her name is Taja Billingsley so if you haven't checked out part one make sure you listen to that first before you listen to this so that you get the full context of who Taja Billingsley is and the background that she grew up in so that you can get the proper context to um, the deep part of this conversation that you're about to hear. This is part two of our conversation where we delve into some juicy details on a relationship scenario that she had and how that affected her mental health and we look at the bigger picture in terms of the chemistry we see between black guys and black girls and what we can do to better support each other and communicate with each other um and but it's really great <clears throat> sorry it's really great to hear a female perspective on it and to hear in a sense the weight that a lot of black women mothers aunties sisters girlfriends the weight they feel in a sense to kind of look out for the black man but the question is as black men are we looking out for our black women so that's kind of the heart of what we talk about in this part of our conversation and yeah i'm just gonna get straight into it um and hopefully this is informative for my predominantly black male audience and obviously you know um, this is a really deep topic that we could talk about for hours so if you feel a a few things are glossed over then i apologize but we did have a limit on our time so (laughs) yeah we we with what we had we tried to be as detailed as possible but anyway so let's get into it part two of my conversation with taja billingsley enjoy it seemed that growing up you had a relatively you know healthy way of perceiving yourself Um, i guess could you take me through um obviously the challenges to that so you you've talked a little bit about especially was it your high school years um or even like tell me through through the times where you know you had maybe this conflict in your identity um, you said, you know, there's various aspects of your identity that um, have an impact on you. The fact that you're a black woman, you're Muslim. Um, I guess, um, like, what kind of difficult times did you have in terms of people kind of um, bringing you down for any of those aspects of your identity? And what impacts did that have on your mental health or your self-perception? Oh boy. Okay. Okay. Now we're about to get to the nitty gritty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so honestly, you know, people tell but only me share what you're comfortable with sharing. Nah, I'm just gonna put it out there. So cool. um <laughs> Grace Academy um is my way of kind of telling a cautionary tale. Mm-hmm. Um my senior year I met a very bad person. Um, This very bad person did not respect my faith, my boundaries, and overall um, just basically hurt my self-esteem for um, a really long time because, you know, hurt people hurt people. Yep. And so they would put me in situations that I never thought I imagined finding myself in. Um, And uh, it definitely took a toll on my entire family's relationship because I was so, I was more scared of what my family would think of me 
mm. rather than getting rid of this particular person in my life. Um, so things only got worse <laughs> with this particular person because I just watched a video on YouTube um, basically talking about this. Um, you teach people how they want to treat you. Mm. So they can only push you as far as you allow them. And so me being a person who does not like conflict, mm. I um, basically, you know, ignored the foolishness, ignored the signs or basically just tried to, you know, get them to, you know, calm down, quiet down, you know, just basically trying to push it up under the rug rather than actually confronting it. And it really just blew up in my face. Um, you know, that's when I actually started having to go to like counseling and whatnot. Um, just having to learn how to really face reality for what it was, you know, yeah. this person. How, how old were you at this time? I was 17 and I basically mm. went through this all the way up to I was 19 years old. Mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, when it finally did stop, that's when my parents actually got involved. And so, yeah, Grace Academy is basically me telling my story um, because how the black community handled my situation, um, how the black community handles situations that for girls who've gone through these types of situations. Um, yeah, I want to bring awareness to it. So it is a cautionary tale. So for, for the listeners, just specify what Grace Academy is and then maybe just specify a little bit more on the situation that happened. So was this like a romantic relationship? Was it a friendship or, you know, and what, what sort of individual were you dealing with? Was he, was he, or I don't know if it was a he or she, or if it was a he, you know, was he white? Was, like what, what was the specific kind of clash? If, if you want to get into that detail and also kind of link that to Grace Academy and what exactly Grace Academy is. Okay, so Grace Academy is about a young girl who went through a pretty traumatic event. Yeah, so and it's an animation, right? Yes, it is that an you're working on series. Yeah. Um, it is okay. not a kids animated series. It's adult mm. animated series because the themes are so mature. Mm. Um, why, why is it called Grace Academy? Um, so I was listening to a Beyonce song. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the song was called My Power. Um, oh, I know that one. From yeah. The, uh, Lion King soundtrack. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Beyonce said, I gotta protect my grace. Mm. Yeah. And so basically, Grace Academy is basically doubling down on what it means to be a woman, you know, um, basically learning how to, you know, be happy with yourself. Um, and so it's basically like a college um, that is also a bit of a charm school. So, yeah, there's going to be like classes where, you know, you have to learn how to walk a certain way in society. Um, I guess how to learn how to present yourself. And so my character going through, you know, after going through that traumatic experience, she needs to learn how to cope mm. with this. So being surrounded by a bunch of women who may have gone through something similar or can help her basically get her self-esteem to a much better place, just feeling better about herself. I figure why not do that? Mm. Mm. So, yeah, um, the Grace Academy is supposed to be split into three different books. Um, the first book is called Refuge. So she's seeking refuge at this school. The second book is called Faith, where she has to reclaim her faith after dealing with that traumatic experience. And the last book is called Identity. So it's reassuring her identity within herself and also helping others to, I guess, find themselves. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And relating back to the situation you had, kind of what what's the parallel between that storyline and kind of more of the details of what you experienced? So... My mom told me I'm not allowed to have a boyfriend. Guess what I did? I had a boyfriend. And that was a very bad idea because it was the worst kind of... Mm, mm. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so he was very insecure within himself. Um, it turned out he went through something pretty traumatic himself. Okay. And he was he white, black? Black. black. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, if, it, if he was white, my parents would have been like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, my parents would disown me if they ever caught me with a white boy. <laughs> mm. um, because there's been so many incidents, you know, with biracial couples, you know, some people decide to ignore the signs of, you know, mm. being so different and possibly some racist um, mannerisms and yeah. things that might be said. Um, it's the family that you're connecting with as well. Like, sure, that your partner accepts you for who you are, but what about their family, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and what about your family integrating with their family, you know? Yeah, so it's, it's, that's it's not yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, my parents would throw off it, but um, mm. yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting. So obviously you, you said that the guy you were dating, he was black, and but you, you started to say that he had his own struggles and insecurities. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's quite interesting because obviously mental roots, this podcast is mainly for, is mainly targeted at young black men and the fact that as black men especially, mm -hmm. we can find it especially hard to articulate um, our feelings and our mental health issues and, you know, this stigma of mental health within the black community first of all but even more so within male circles and mm -hmm. um, toxic ideas of what it means to be a man from right. your perspective looking back can you i guess if if you feel comfortable maybe delve a little bit more into um the issues that your partner had and maybe the knock-on effect that had on the relationship you're trying to have with him because i think is the good thing about having you on this podcast is getting a black female perspective mm -hmm. and realizing that as black men the decisions we make not only affect ourselves but our sis our black sisters as well mm -hmm. and there's a there's a relation there's a responsibility that all parties have you know like mm -hmm. the way I treat my own mental health as a black man will have an impact on the way I'm able to treat and protect the black women in my life. Right. So kind of you, you maybe just give some details on kind of the issues maybe that you could see in the guy. Maybe, maybe at the time you weren't able to tell, but looking back, kind of what's your perspective on the issues that this guy was dealing with and how that impacted you as a black girl? Okay, so what I, um, I guess the best way to describe it, because whenever I see people, um, you know, I basically like notice some things, so, you know, their mannerisms, how they talk, how they move around. Um, so basically what I noticed about him was the fact that he was constantly seeking validation. Mm. He always wanted some type of validation. Um, my mom told me if a man is dragging his mother through mud, talking bad about her, leave him alone. Mm. He talked so bad about his mother saying that, you know, she did not care about him, that, you know, she has all these expectations and that um, she just, she just wanted, you know, she didn't really want him to be there. She just wanted, you know, you know, things like money or some other things and whatnot. And I met her. Um, she was not as bad as he described her to be. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, she was honestly just telling him to do better. And the thing mm -hmm. is, he wanted to be defiant. And part of the reason why is because what happened to him when he was younger, um, he didn't tell anybody. And the thing is, because he wasn't telling anybody what happened with him, he um, got angry with everyone. Um, and I guess another thing is, you know, sometimes when you're in these type of like men, like dark, in a dark mentality, mm -hmm. you kind of wish somebody would be there just to notice something's off. And I'm mm -hmm. guessing because his mom didn't notice it, 
he got angry with her, started taking things out on her, getting in trouble, mm. blaming her, saying all these things. Because I noticed this happens with a lot of the black men here in America. They blame the black woman for everything that goes wrong in their life. Mm. Yeah, some of them, not all of them, but mm. yeah, it is a matter of, you know, taking on responsibility um, and accountability. They lack mm. that. And, you know, the thing why I said if he was white, it would have been a completely different story um, because there's a stigma or this idea where you always have to protect the black men, the black boys, protect them no matter what. Mm. Yeah. And so, you know, the situation got really bad. If I had a report, had a police report involved, the police got involved in everything. And the thing is, I said, I want to press charges. My mom said, no, why would you want to do that? He could go to jail. Wow. He's taking revenge, not just mom, but other people involved. And so, friends and family. So it was just like, wait, why? This, he did this. It's a matter of taking accountability. He did this. And so he has to pay for what he did. Mm. People are like, no, protect. You're taking revenge. Why are you doing that? I'm just like, are you kidding me? Are you being serious? Do you see what how I'm feeling? Do you see mm. how I'm moving around nowadays? I'm not happy. I don't feel safe. And the fact that you're telling me, you know, protect him when he's the one who's doing all this craziness, not just to me, but to other people. Mm. That's not okay. So mm. there is a um, lack of accountability when it comes to these black men here. I don't know That's if it's so like deep. in the UK. That's so deep. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this insightful episode so far. Uh, I just want to use this brief intermission to quickly share with you something that's really been helping me the past few months in terms of my physical health, which in turn has helped my mental health too. Because you see, it's very easy for us to talk about mental health, uh, forgetting that our physical health is connected with it, you know, because our bodies do need certain nutrients and um, certain things to help our brain deal with the stress that's running through our body and so um, you know to manage our adrenaline levels to manage our adaptogens and so and so the past few months I've been using a variety of um, food supplement products to help me in different aspects of my health for example um, to help me with my stress levels and my concentration levels uh, I've been taking these really great organic um, optimized nootropics um, shots or which are abbreviated as on shots um, the little juice pouches um, that are have a rich flavor a rich raspberry flavor which you can mix with water or your own kind of um, drink mixture and it's been helping me just about one cup a day has helped me get through my course workload as well as my podcasting as well as all my other content uh, including my mental root short film and so uh, if you're someone like me who's pretty hard working and easily gets quite stressed or worn out through work um, these are great um, caffeine natural caffeine um, shots that you can take without the usual crash that you get from coffees and energy monster drinks and all of that stuff so if you want to know more about that there is actually a link in the written description for this podcast episode uh, and you can book a quick consultation uh, call with me where we can discuss these products and where you can get them from uh, it is a particular brand which i'm keeping on the low key for now because it's one of those things where it's so good you just kind of want to keep it to yourself and only share it with people who you know are genuinely interested and so yeah just um uh, select a time slot in that uh, link and we'll uh, consult you and there are other products as well including some really rare um wild alaskan uh fish oil um, pills which i've been using not your typical fish oil pills um obviously rich in omega-3 but for me personally they've really helped me wake up uh with a fresh mind um, with no baggy eyes very clear white eyes which is quite unusual for me um, i usually get red eyes and you know it takes me quite a while to um get started and get energized in the morning 
um, but these pills have just sped up that process to help me start the day better, uh, which is also very important. The way we start our days has a huge impact on our mental and emotional outlook throughout the day. So um, if you also want to know about that, you can, again, book that slot in the link to meet me and talk about that. But regardless of what um, products and foods and drinks that you take, uh, just remember to think about the nutrients, do your research, see what nutrients are important for your body to help your uh, mental health and to help your physical health as well, to help your stress levels. And let's be practical in how we deal with our mental health too. So with all that said, let's hop back into the interview. That's so deep because... And the funny thing is, we're doing this interview on Mother's Day as well. You know, the irony, right? Like, I'm I'm blessed. Me and you are blessed to have both parents, you know, equally mm-hmm. being active in the family. But of unfortunately for, you know, many reasons that I've kind of already t- touched on in this podcast, you know, we're seeing a lot of, I guess, I, I don't want to say it's exclusive to the Black community, but Mm-hmm. especially in the black community the father figure it's like if the father figure isn't present it's not a surprise you know because mm-hmm. we've got and that's probably why uh, correct me if i'm wrong that's probably why maybe your family and people are saying hey don't get him you know locked up because it's like we keep losing our young black men but at mm-hmm. the same time you felt this thing that you had to protect him but he wasn't protecting you and he wasn't protecting other people that he knew Mm -hmm. so just tell the listeners right now especially young black men watching this um obviously my audience is mostly british but it's the same it's the same thing you know we we still like even in this country wherever wherever you have a community of black people in a society where you know, um, whiteness, you know, is the, is the majority. There's a lot of these um, complex relationships that we have in our communities because Mm -hmm. we're put in situations where we end up turning against each other. It could Mm -hmm. be a poverty mindset. It could be, um, all sorts of things to do with living in an environment that isn't conducive to a healthy mindset. Right. And we end up having things like not just gang violence, but also taking our women for granted. We respect our mothers, days like Mother's Day. And I think of a lot of rappers giving respect to their mothers in their songs. But the young mothers coming up, we treat them like trash. Mm -hmm. So what, what song, how, how do you want young black men to think when it comes to their fellow sisters and dating black girls like from your experience what would be your message to them um let's see uh i'll definitely recommend a youtuber um his name well his youtube channel is called the shoe make way that's s-h-u-m-a-k-e Okay. Way can you put it in the chat? <laughs> yeah, I actually put it in the chat. Yeah, um, cool. yeah, he um talks about you know the relationships between black men and women, mm. uh, and um okay, he was basically it. yeah I hope I spelled that right um I'll send it to you later but cool. um yeah he was he's been talking about how. Black men and Black women are very much so divided right now. Um, And the fact that, you know, when Black women get out their race, they are heavily criticized. Um, They're basically saying you're turning your back against your race, Mm -hmm. especially if they're with a white man. So when it but when it comes to Black men, you know, nobody says anything when they date, you know, white women, um, you know, people who are Hispanic women who are Hispanic or any other, you know, race out there. And so this YouTuber was talking about how the fact that there seems to be a trend that is starting to pick up 
where black women are now being with white men because it is beneficial to both of them because black women are just seeking protection and just being heard while white men you know in a way um i don't know it seems like they're i don't know just black women being black you know very i don't know something you know just a little i don't know it's just something about black women you know i'm not you know knocking anybody else but the way they talk about black women sometimes it's just like oh well, okay, but you know, um, it's just the fact that you know some black women are very like nurturing. You know, we listen. Um, we're definitely you know more sympathetic. So I guess that's kind of how we can be. I'm not knocking anybody else. You know, you can be that way as well. But yeah. it's something you know. And he mentioned you know the fact that in some cases that when a black woman and a black man, but I mean white men end up together. You know, the marriage is, um, the marriage rates are, they're more likely to stay together, less likely to get divorced versus a black man and a white woman being together. And then, um, yeah, they also have, when it comes to a white man and a white woman, and a black man and a black woman together versus, you know, a black woman and a white man being together, the chances are much higher when it comes to the black woman white man being together because in some cases um it might be true um mm. black women are better equipped to kind of well at least here in america um mm. to you know handle some of the issues that we deal with um versus a black man uh, mm. he's mentioned something about how black women might be the stronger between the genders, at least here. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. You can stop me there, you know, but um, mm. that that's kind of a thing, you know, that might mm. be true, <laughs> mm. <laughs> at least mm. here. Um, because yeah, I mean, I guess there's tons of research that can be done about that. And you, you sparked my interest now. So I'll, it's interesting <laughs> to see that, uh, yeah, just the, the 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 dynamics of race within um, relationships, you know. Yeah. Um, and to be fair, I under I think I understand where you're coming from because, and that's that's why I'm doing this podcast because, man, it's like, as as one sec, sorry. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, as black men, there's so many things going on, you know, um, mm -hmm. and we are as as much as we are in danger in different ways. Mm -hmm. We are also in a place of privilege, and we need to realize that where we need to yeah. use our privilege as men to not just see it as oh i have to date more black girls you know i need to appreciate black girls beauty more it's not even up just that it's all aspects of the black woman like how is the black woman treated in workplaces and mm -hmm. um the opportunities they have access to and things like that like how are we right. support in, in these other arenas you know and when we support right. and there is yeah when we support oh, sorry, our black women we're supporting ourselves because like it's it's all a community thing you know as black women you're obviously there's various types i can't you know use a broad paintbrush to <laughs> depict every woman but mm -hmm. in my life i've seen a lot of strong black girls and strong black women being such a great support um and being truthful and honest and nurturing like you said and when we look after our black women as black men we look after ourselves because right you add value to us you know mm -hmm. so i think that's a great thing that we've we've you've brought up um and leading on from that so you had this mm -hmm. kind of difficult experience what effect did that have on you and 
I guess, getting into a HBCU, how did that kind of change things for you, I guess? So. Yeah, so my HBCU was in the town I was living in. So literally, I went from, you know, being in high school, literally just going to the school that was less than 20 minutes away from mm. where I was at. Well, yeah, it's in the same city. So, yeah, basically the transition was not that bad because um, fam, you, when you're at HBCU, it's not just the school, it's the entire community. Um, and so being at FAMU, volunteering you know, throughout high school and whatnot, I got to really know folks there at FAMU. Now, regarding that particular person, they actually followed me <laughs> to that school and they brought the foolishness with them. And so it only got worse, especially when my parents moved all the way to the other side of the United States because I was down in Florida. They were all the way up in Michigan, um, up in Detroit. And so this particular person thought that was a great opportunity to make things even harder for me. Um, so going through that, um, I was, you know, trying to, it messed with how I um, saw people. Um, I wasn't picking the best friends um, because they were definitely taking advantage of me. Um, And so I had to learn how to cut them off. But I was also isolating myself from talking to other people because this guy was literally whispering in my ear, you know, you can't trust this person. You can't trust that person. Mm. They want to take advantage of you and all this and that. So it really hurt my self-esteem just trying to find. What, What was it within you? that made you want to listen to him? Because I'm always curious to hear as females, what is it we do as men that ends up, you know, doing so much damage and almost affecting the way you perceive the world? Like, what what was it within you that kind of gave him that space? It was more so persistence and then finding manipulative like tactics to kind of isolate me so um, yeah but i mean what were you trying to get from him you know was it a sense of validation at the time or i don't don't know um that's quite a deep question but it was more so him trying to get validation from me and more so me feeling bad for him because he would always try to you know say you know, nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody does this or that for me. Mm. You're the only one who's there for me. So right. it's the fact that, okay. you know, basically, it felt you like, felt like was, you had to be his crutch. Yeah, basically. Right. That's that's the problem. It's more so, not so much me seeking validation. It's more so them seeking validation and making you feel bad for leaving them behind. Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay, and I noticed that with people who create those type of situations, I've seen it um, happen to so many people. Like um, mm. there was a TV show where I literally saw this happen with this successful woman who's living her best life, but mm. the thing is, the person she was with was holding her back. Mm. Yeah. So powerful. yeah. Mm. So you can be successful as is. You can be extremely successful, but if that particular person is behind you, they can literally take those opportunities away from you because they get you to second guess yourself. Yeah. Yeah. By making you feel bad, like you're doing something wrong when you are not doing nothing wrong. Mm. Nothing. The only person that's doing the wrong is them. Yeah. It's like a. In the UK, we have this saying, crabs in a bucket. I don't know if you've heard it. But basically, it's kind of used to describe um, kind of a group of people who are um, obviously oppressed in some way and you're in an environment where, again, it's quite toxic. So it relates to the black experience, basically, um, the inner city black experience where if you see a fellow black person making it out, in a sense Mm -hmm. there's this jealousy there's this hey don't forget me you know and you can't be successful without me because 
yeah, it's just again this poverty mentality. This is either you or me. This, you know, um, mm -hmm. survivors mentality where we drag. There's this instinct within us to drag each other down if we see right. each other being a bit too successful. You mm -hmm. know, um, I think that's kind of changing now. Um, in the UK, I'm seeing less of that in terms of the more representation we're having mm -hmm. and the support we're having in the black music scene here in the UK and even in the world of film, we're seeing a lot more collaboration between yeah. black artists. So I think things are improving, but there's always that classic issue of as black people, we always, you know, right. yeah, there's that kind of jealousy. So yeah, yeah, when you were talking, that's the kind of thing that happens, that crab in a bucket mentality. And it's called crabs in a bucket because mm -hmm. um, it's been observed that when crabs are collected in a bucket, you know, mm -hmm. you see the crabs trying to pull another crab down if it tries to escape. So right. that's where the saying comes from. But yeah, that's... Yeah, I mm. definitely see what you're talking about. I think that's also happening within the Black women space in the music industry because I'm noticing a lot mm. of female rappers did not used to collaborate like that. In fact, they used to just beef with each other. Now I'm seeing every female rapper collaborate with each other at some point. Mm. And so, or singer, in fact. So I'm noticing that um, regarding the black male side, I'm not too sure about that one because in these like spaces, these, especially the workplace and whatnot, sometimes mm. black women and men are competing against each other to be yeah. successful. I noticed that. And so that's just something to kind of keep in mind when you get into these spaces and whatnot, um, you should really look out for each other because you're both looking, making yourself look bad when you are beefing or, you know, fighting with each other or just being nasty towards each other. Because at the end of the day, everybody else sees y'all as just black, you know? There you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And all and unity, the huge part of that black unity is the relationship relationship between the black man and the black woman. Mm -hmm. So again, comes back to this theme, this strong theme that's coming across in our conversation. Well, that is the end of part two. Thank you for listening. Um, and the conversation that I had with Taja only gets better from this point onward. So we've got one more part to this conversation that is coming out next week. And in this third and final there, yeah. <laughs> in this third and final part that is coming out next week, um, I have a really good chat with Taja about her experience in having therapy in her HBCU. Um, so for me it was just eye-opening because I start to be a bit more transparent about my perspective on where I'm at in terms of my need for therapy I'm still on my journey um, trying to find the right fit for me in terms of therapy and knowing exactly what kind of therapy is good for me so um, I start to talk a little bit more about that as well so you don't want to miss that episode and just a reminder, you can find Taja's um, Instagram tag uh, in the description, the written description for this episode, wherever you are listening. Um, so that's It's About Truth at I-S-S-A-B-O-U-T-T-R-U-T-H. So that's her Instagram tag where you can hear, you can see a bit more in terms of the development of her animation idea grace academy i think it's a great idea and um yeah to go and support her go and um check out her work and i look forward to hear you seeing there uh, i'm not going to see or hear you guys uh, <laughs> i look forward to you guys tuning in um next week as of the time i'm recording this uh so yeah spread the word keep sharing this podcast uh, keep um showing support on instagram again my instagram tags are always in the written description at nath a day n-a-t-h underscore a double d-a-i and all the content and latest updates and more details on the mental roots short film that i've just finished will be revealed um in due time on my social media so once again thank you if you're new 
welcome um and we are going to keep it pushing till next week take care of yourselves and i'm out